Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, we begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending salat and salam upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Dear Muslims, one of the most powerful moments in the seerah, so powerful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down Quran to tell us what happened, was when our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was fleeing from Mecca to Medina and the Quraysh were in hot pursuit. He didn't have any armies. He didn't have a large legion of protectors. He didn't have even 10, 20 people to surround him. Just him and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. And they went into the Ghar of Thawr. And the Quraysh were literally outside. And Abu Bakr radiallahu an begins trembling. Ya Rasulallah, if they just look down, they will see us. And what did the Prophet ﷺ say? Allah recorded it. It is in the Quran. This episode of the seerah is so important. It is recorded in vivid detail in the Quran itself. إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَنَا When the Prophet ﷺ told his companion, don't worry, Allah is with us. Don't worry, Allah is with us. Dear Muslims, this is our slogan. This is our motto. This is the kalima that we say whenever we're faced with stress. We say, La tahzan inna Allah ma'ana. We're not going to get worried. We're not going to get sad. We're not going to get scared. How can we get scared when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with us? And I began my talk today with this incident simply because, frankly, we live in times that sometimes are very depressing. We are witnessing a long list of tragedies, internal and external, domestic and international. Civil war in so many Muslim lands, refugees here and there, the persecution of the Uyghurs, Kashmir and Palestine for Allah knows how long, Islamophobia within our own ranks. So let us put everything into perspective. As long as we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then everything else is secondary. As long as our connection with Allah is strong, then insha'Allah ta'ala, things are gonna turn out for the best. If not in our lifetimes, eventually they will turn out. So remember this slogan from the seerah, la tahzan inna Allah ma'ana. Be optimistic, don't be depressing. Look at the bright side, don't look at the negative. Consider the positives and know that you can do something. Now I know that I'm coming at the end of a very long conference, alhamdulillah, the largest conference in your city of Minneapolis, walillah alham. I know that you are listening to lecture after lecture. So I'm gonna summarize my points in three very different topics. And all of them are pertinent and relevant. Some of them are somewhat controversial, but it needs to be said. These three things need to be said bluntly. And I begin with my first point, brothers and sisters. We have a lot of problems going on internally in our own communities. And my first point, listen to me carefully, Muslims. My advice to myself and all of you, strive for unity in as many areas as you can with your fellow Muslims, in your communities, in your masajid, in your organizations, in your families. Follow teachers and preachers that are telling you to come together and marginalize teachers and preachers that make other Muslims the enemies. One of the problems we have, and I'm gonna be blunt here brothers and sisters, because we don't have the luxury of not being blunt. We have to call a spade a spade. One of the problems we have is that when one of us becomes somewhat religious, somewhat practicing, somewhat interested in Islam, there is a very easy, slippery slope to hardcore fanaticism, ultra-radicalism, considering everybody else of the good Muslim community is a sellout, considering the entire ummah is lost, except for my small group and my five or 10 people and my sheikh with our hardcore group. And we see this time and time again. 
the slippery slope of radicalism, the slippery slope of fanaticism, the slippery slope of sectarianism. And such talk, it sounds very alluring to the 20-year-old mind, the 21-year-old mind. It's very comforting. Everybody's lost except me, except my gang, except our people. But the ummah is broader than your five people, oh brothers. The ummah and the good that it has is far broader than this small group. Our Prophet wasallam said, listen to this hadith in Sahih Muslim. Whoever says the whole ummah is lost and destroyed, he is the one who is the most lost and destroyed. This is a hadith in Sahih Muslim. Whoever says everybody in the ummah is misguided, the one who's the most misguided is that person. The ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by and large is a blessed ummah. This is not me speaking. This is the Quran and the Sunnah. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas. You are the best ummah that Allah has created for mankind. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inna ummati ummatan marhuma. My ummah is a blessed ummah. It is an ummah that Allah has shown rahma to. So any group that comes along and says only we are the right people and everybody else is going to Jahannam, this person has completely lost the plot. The bulk of the ummah is upon good. The bulk and the majority of this ummah is upon khair. And anybody who tells you otherwise, frankly, they're ignorant and they're wrong. And you have to be careful, brothers and sisters, of following such preachers and teachers. We have seen what happens when sectarianism becomes rampant in our own ranks. We have seen what happens when we start fighting each other. Look at the Crusades. The only reason they managed to get to Palestine was because we were fighting one another. Look at Andalus. The only reason we lost it is because we were fighting one another. Look at the Battle of Badr and Uhud. In the Battle of Badr, Allah praised the Muslims. You came together and so you were victorious. And in the Battle of Uhud, Allah Azza wa Jal said, when you started disagreeing amongst yourselves, hatta idha fashiltum wa tanaza'tum fil amr. When you started fighting and bickering, Allah's rahmah was lifted up from you. Brothers and sisters, again, I'm being very blunt here. We need to learn to work together in spite of our differences. The ummah is diverse. You are never ever going to unite the ummah on every aspect of methodology, every aspect of law, every aspect of theology. It's not going to happen. So we have to deal with the reality as it is. You want me to be blunt? I'll be even more blunt. Salafis and Sufis, Ikhwanis and Tablighis, all of these mainstream movements, we cannot take each other as the enemy. How can you take somebody as the enemy who's lowering his head to Allah more than 30 times a day? How can you create division amongst people who love Allah and love the Messenger? We are already a minority in this land. We are already less than 1% of this land. Within that 1%, less than 10% are actually coming to the conventions, coming to the Salah, coming to Eid. So we are collectively, the religious Muslims, probably closer to 0.1% of this country. Now, this 0.1%, if we are gonna start bickering amongst ourselves, oh, I don't like that guy because his view of something is this. Oh, this guy follows another sheikh. Oh, this guy has that. Subhanallah. When the religious folks start fighting amongst themselves, what do you expect the non-religious folks to do? Muslims, we need to work together in spite of our differences for the greater good. Figure out a way. Now listen to me carefully. I'm not saying all the differences are legit. I never said that. I'm not saying all the differences are tolerated. I'm not saying that. What am I saying? Whatever your views might be on aspects of theology, on aspects of fiqh, on aspects of methodology, as long as it is within the mainstream. Now, what is the mainstream? Anybody who loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wants to follow the messenger of Allah. Anybody who believes in the Quran and the Sunnah, anybody who believes in the Hadith of Jibreel, the five arkan of Islam, the six arkan of Iman, this is mainstream Islam. Within this, from the beginning of time, we've had differences. From the time of the Sahaba, we've had differences of opinion. They themselves had differences of opinion. We cannot afford the luxury 
of increasing sectarianism given the realities of our ummah. Subhanallah, I have said this so bluntly at Islamic conferences. When you, students of knowledge, when you, people who are interested in Islam, are fighting one another about some aspect of theology, about whether the mawlid is sunnah or bid'ah, you guys are fighting about some aspect that is so advanced, your own cousins, your own children are debating, is Islam true or not? Why should I be a Muslim? Is the Prophet a prophet? Have you lost the plot? You are fighting over such an advanced issue, such an abstract issue. When our children are struggling with Iman itself, they're flirting with Kufr, they're thinking of agnosticism and atheism. What is the matter with you? How are you judging? Any Shaykh and Alim who prioritizes hating other Muslims, frankly, I'm telling you, start avoiding these people. Means they have lost the plot as well. We cannot import the politics of the Middle East. We cannot import the sectarian of hatred from overseas. We see what's happening over there. We see the bloodshed that sectarianism has caused and their Muslim majority. How much more so when we're a minority? Do you want to import that type of understanding over here? La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. It's time for the American Muslim community to mature up, to grow up, and to learn to work together in spite of differences. You know, when you have a fight with your cousin, with your uncle, with your brother, it's painful. But in the end of the day, it stays within the family. In the end of the day, they're your family, and you have to deal with it as if they're family. This is the example of within the ummah. I am not saying all interpretations are the same. Nobody misquote me. As you know, this is one of my problems. Everybody's misquoting everything. Allah musta'an. I'm saying explicitly, they're not all the same. But deal with it. What are you going to do if somebody prays different than you? What are you going to do if somebody has slightly different practices, slightly different theology? Do they love Allah, yes or no? Are they prostrating in front of Allah towards the Kaaba, yes or no? Do they read the Quran, yes or no? Why don't you look at what is in common before you jump to the differences? How can you ignore the 99% that is the same and you only worry about the 1% that is different? Mature up, brothers and sisters. Point number one, every one of you now start working actively in your organizations, in your communities, in your masajid to start cooperating with other Muslims. Look at the reality of what is happening. Look at the agendas that are being forced upon us, upon our children, sexuality, immorality, all of these things. And here we are, the Muslim community, bickering over abstract issues that have no tangible value to ourselves and our children. Wallahi, these are plots of shaitan. Shaitan's the one benefiting, not us. And I will tell you bluntly, in every strand of Islam, in every movement of Islam, in every ideology, you will find open-minded leaders and clerics who understand, yes, this is my way, but I need to come together for the greater good. Those are your teachers. Those are your mentors. And in every strand, you will find the hardliners, the far rights, the fanatics and the bigots. Those who think my way or the highway. Those who think it is more important to spread hatred of other Muslims than to preserve Iman of the Muslims of the next generation. And I'm telling you bluntly, marginalize them. Don't give them platforms. Don't listen to such preachers of hate because it's only going to make things worse for us. We don't need hatred. We need love amongst ourselves. We need to unite under the kalima of La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. We need to learn to work together in spite of our differences for the greater good. And this means every single person who says the kalima has some relationship with us. Every single mosque, every single organization, we need to come together for the greater good. And then you know what? Sometimes for some events, we'll have two different things, no problem. There are groups out there, they're gonna do things I don't agree with. Okay, you do it on this day, we'll do it on this day. But don't we, can't we come together to fight Islamophobia? Can't we come together to fight the drug problem in our own communities? Can't we come together to make sure we don't elect a politician that wants to shut down our masajid, harm our Dixie schools? How can we possibly not come together for the greater good? So point number one, brothers and sisters, enough 
of sectarianism, enough of partisanship, enough of bigotry and hatred. Look at the broader picture. And you know where it begins from? From you yourself. How so? Find the people that are like-minded. Find the people that are similar like you and build bridges in your own associations, in your own masajid, in your own communities. And when people come along trying to break those bridges, trying to divide, tell them you're not, that type of thought is not welcome here. Go preach that hatred somewhere else. Love begins from the home. And building bridges begins at the microcosm level. That's you and all of the communities that you're doing. So, that's my first point. We need to literally battle against fanaticism and sectarianism. The second point that we have is more difficult. And it's something that, again, a conference is not the time or the place to fully go into it. But still, it needs to be said. And that is, the problems that we have as an American Muslim community, frankly, are very different than the problems that one finds in our classical books. The problems of battling atheism, agnosticism, Darwinism, immorality, incorrect sexuality, the problems of people leaving our faith and why are they leaving the faith? What are the causes for them to doubt their Islam? Therefore, the solutions to these problems are not things that are easily manageable by people like myself who have trained in traditional seminaries. We might have to think of new ideas to solve these problems. The problems of modernity, the problems of our generation are very unique, unprecedented. We don't have easy solutions. When our college kids, our youth come to us and they say, why should I be a Muslim? And they bring some very, very difficult issues that are common in our times. I don't need to go into them on stage, but you get my point. Frankly, my training in Medina did not prepare me for the questions of this generation. The conversations they're having about modernity, humanism, secularism, feminism, gender, gender roles, LGBT, all of these things. How we navigate through this is not easy. And all of us are in the same boat. So my point is, what is my point? <laughs> Let me phrase this in a manner that is not going to get into more trouble. We are all attempting to find a solution. We haven't found an easy one. If people make mistakes in this process, cut them some slack if their track record clearly shows that they're trying to help the community. Another problem we have is the cancel culture that is rampant, not only in our midst, but in the broader culture that we live in. One mistake, one slip up, one word that somebody doesn't like, and khalas, you destroy an entire preacher, an entire teacher, an entire lifetime of good. We Muslims do not believe in the cancel culture. Imagine if Allah Azza wa Jal used the cancel culture on you when you're entering Jannah. Imagine if Allah found one fault, and said, khalas, the rest of your deeds are in vain. Be respectful of your elders and of your preachers and teachers. And understand that we live in a time and place where, frankly, I don't have all the solutions. What do we do with the rise of immorality, the rise of alternative sexualities? How do we protect our children? To what level do we argue for freedoms for all versus restrictions for all? I don't have the answers. Nobody does. But it's going to take trial and error. It's going to take a few runs. Cut us some slack. And understand that in order to get to the right solution, maybe some mistakes are going to have to be made in the process. And if there is a difference of opinion amongst the scholarly community, respect it and don't get involved. Don't make the situation worse. Going back to my first point of sectarianism. Especially when it comes to politics. Especially when it comes to how we deal with these topics of a political nature. Wallahi, it's not easy. What do we do when some of the Muslims in Congress are saying and doing things we don't like? Again, I'm being honest here. What do we do? To what level do we boycott them? 
to what level do we not support them when they are helping us in some causes and not helping us in other causes? I'm not going to give you an answer right now, but I will tell you one thing. Do not demonize somebody who disagrees with your analysis. Let there be some diversity of thought here. Understand the Sharia does not dictate political alliances. The Sharia does not force you to undertake only one path. This is a very, very tricky issue. Even in the time of the companions, there were differences of opinion. So much so, they even went to war over politics. You don't think we're going to have some disagreement amongst ourselves? Let there be that disagreement. Choose your opinion. Choose your side. And then don't demonize the other side. As long as that person is within the mainstream. Live and let live. So, the second point. Bit of a complex issue, but still. To solve the problems of modernity and to navigate our way as an American Muslim community. I mean, guys, let's be honest here. 30 years ago, the default was voting is haram. I grew up in that era, back in the 80s and 90s. We were told you shouldn't even vote in the elections. 30 years ago, this was the norm. 9-11 happened and we all understood the foolishness of that ideology. If you don't exercise your constitutional right to be heard, you're going to be eaten up and devoured by the politicians. If you don't stand up and fight for your political rights, like every single minority fought for its political rights, you're not going to get any political rights. And we saw this post 9-11. Those of you that are too young to remember, speak to your elders. 9-11 for us as the American Muslim community was a huge wake-up call. It galvanized us. It made us understand that we don't have the luxury to be apolitical. Our masjids were being shut down. Our scholars were being kicked out. Our preachers were being locked up and jailed on false charges. All of you who are above the age of 30 remember that era. And the only way we got some of our rights back is we kept on taking them to court. And we kept on holding our politicians liable according to our own constitution. If we cut off from reality, and if we lived in our little bubble, none of this would have happened. Unfortunately, we see a new generation. And again, we don't have the luxury to mince my words. A new generation born post 9-11 have forgotten the realities of what happened in 9-11. And we see them gravitate towards a type of political isolation. We see the same type of rhetoric, the same type of cancel culture. Anybody who tries to get involved with politics is immediately shut down, immediately demonized, immediately cut off. And we need to teach these youngsters that the world is not idealistic. The world is not simplistic and black and white. In order to effect change, sometimes you have to enter a gray area. I'm not advocating entering that area. I'm not a politician, and I don't want to be a politician. But those who are, or those who are involved in it, it is what it is. And we need to be wise enough and politically savvy enough to understand that there is a function and a tool and to not make this the end all and be all. So that is my second point, political maturity. Understanding that the world is a complex place. We don't have all the answers. People might make mistakes, but in the end of the day, if the, the goal is to carve out space for us as Muslims and to protect our freedoms as Muslims, well then cut them some slack and learn from their mistakes. That's my second point. My third and final point, brothers and sisters, is that in light of all that is happening and in light of all of the changes taking place in sexuality, in immorality, in light of all of these changes, I remind you of one very, very important fundamental issue of our faith, and that is the importance of the family, the importance of the family unit the importance of the mother and father. All Muslims, we live at a time when everything is being rethought. Forget sexuality, forget gender roles, even gender itself, which was uncontested for 10,000 years of human history, for all the entire globe and the entirety of mankind. A man was a man and a woman was a woman. And for this generation, even this is now being rethought. 
Subhanallah, what is left? As Muslims, we have the obligation in the eyes of Allah to be preachers of truth and to be messengers of reality. The only way to do this is by demonstrating to the broader people what it means to be a mother and father, what it means to be a husband and wife, what it means to be a family unit. Parents, the number one mechanism of preserving Islam in the next generation is not by building masajid, it's not by throwing your kids in the duksi thinking it's gonna be a magical transformation. These are all secondary. The number one mechanism of preserving Iman in your children is to have your house, your home, your marriage built upon Islam. Show your children what it means to be a Muslim. The children need to experience the rahmah of Islam from the mother and father. They need to see the reality of a father figure and a mother figure. And this means, oh parents, that we might have to rethink parenting techniques. And I say this all the time. Alhamdulillah, Allah blessed me with amazing parents. I thank Allah. I was born in the 70s, grew up in the 80s in Texas. But my parents were old school. My parents were old school. Fine, for that generation it worked. For the next generation, for my children, and Alhamdulillah, I have four young men and women. They're no longer children. Three are in college and one is in high school. So I'm now, I don't have little kids anymore. I have young adults at home. To raise my own children, I had to carve out my own parenting techniques, trial and error. I could not replicate the techniques of my parents because the times have changed, because the culture has changed. Now I cannot tell you how to be a parent because that is something that is unique and it is also culture based and it is also something that you're gonna have to experiment with. But I will tell you, dear parents, you need to be active in your children's lives. Fathers, you cannot just disappear for work and then think that's it. You must be a father figure in your children's lives. Mothers, you must be a mother figure in your children's lives. It is essential that you demonstrate this reality. Now, if it so happens that, you know, for whatever reason, the family is not, unit is not together. May Allah make it easy. The community comes together. I'm not saying that's the only solution, but where the parents exist, because I understand sometimes one of the parents has passed away, divorce has happened. Okay, that's a separate issue. But where the parents exist, then they need to embody and exemplify the prophetic methodology of being parents. Learn from the Quran and Sunnah, listen to lectures. And most importantly, sincerely try to be a good father and mother. Children will recognize this. You know, anecdotally, I don't have any statistics. I'm just speaking as somebody born and raised in this country. I'm in my fourth, fifth decade of life, in my, four, my 40s right now. I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and I grew up the first batch of immigrant children. The first batch, my father came 1962. I was born in the 70s here in Houston, Texas. Anecdotally, I'm telling you, some of my extended friends left the faith. It is what it is. But I'll tell you one fact. Every single time that I saw a young man or woman stray away, but the parents were upon love and taqwa. The parents had an Islamic household. Eventually, those children came back to Islam. And this is something that I haven't found a single exception for in my own anecdotal life. The only time that people left Islam was when their parents were not upon Islam in the first place. In my own anecdotal experience, when the parents tried their best to be good and loving and caring and compassionate, and they had a beautiful marriage at home, and they had a home based upon the Quran and Sunnah, plenty of times, the young man or woman went far left or far right during college, did things they should not do, stopped practicing Islam, getting involved in the major sins. And perhaps during that time frame, if you ask me, I would have said, there's no way this guy's gonna come back to religion. Knowing his lifestyle, no way. I would have sworn back then. But SubhanAllah, 
Fast forward five, ten years. They get married. They have a kid. And all of a sudden, reality strikes them. And they realize they need to be good parents for the sake of their kids. And because they've had role model parents 30 years ago, because they've seen what it is to be a good mother and father, they go back to the only model they know. And that is the model of their own mother and father. And so amazingly, you find a lot of young men and women in their late 20s and 30s, after they've gone far from the religion, you find them coming back, getting active in masajid, becoming masjid presidents, becoming active in the circle, subhanallah. And what was the secret of success? The parents planting the seeds of iman and taqwa, not knowing how long it's going to take for the seed to sprout out. So brothers and sisters, those of you who are parents, be active in your children's lives. Sit down and talk with them. I know this sounds weird. Try to be friends with them. Our parents didn't do that. May Allah bless them. That's a different generation. But your son or daughter should be able to trust you as a mother or father when they made a mistake. Because if you're not going to correct their mistake properly, I guarantee you, nobody else is going to correct it the way you will. If you're not going to be there loving them, supporting them, and parents as well, let me again say this bluntly. Don't expect your children to be angels. Don't expect your children to not go left and right. Firstly, frankly, were you as angelic as your parents thought you were when you were 19, 20? Did you not go a little bit left and right? Now, if you had the internet and the iPhone and Twitter and Facebook, if you had the resources your children do, what do you think you would have done at that stage? So dear parents, cut them some slack, even if they fall. I'm not saying it's good that they do that, but understand a lot of the blame is not on them. It's on the world that we live in. It's not even their fault. You know what they want the most from you? Love and compassion. That's it. Continue to be supportive and loving. And if they make a mistake, gently tell them to come back. Be supportive. Allow them, allow them to be who they are within the framework of the Sharia. Ah. Make lots of dua for them. And inshallah ta'ala, eventually, even if they go a little bit left and right, they will come back to this deen with lots of dua. Brothers and sisters, time is limited. My time is almost up. The bottom line is as follows. Every one of us has a very important role to play in the current world. And I'll tell you why. We are the generation, this one sitting right here, this crowd, you, you are the primary generation that will dictate the future of Islam in this country for the next 100, 200 years. Think about it. This is the generation that is building the masajid, that is creating the infrastructure. This is the generation that came. Every one of you, by and large, except for the converts, every one of you, you know your roots. You speak the home language, even if it's half-half, but you speak the language. You know where you're from. Well, your children won't have that connection. You are the middle ground. You are the conduit. You have connections back home, and you're building your future over here. The way you set the stage, the way you lay the foundations, that is going to dictate and charter the course of American Islam for the next 150, 200 years. Every one of you, how you practice Islam with your own family is going to be taken down to your grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And that decision is going to be made at this level. So think long and hard and be extra careful and make lots of dua that Allah blesses you and realize Allah Azza wa Jal has chosen you for a very, very magnificent task. Brothers and sisters, my time is up and it is typically my sunnah whenever I finish at a large convention to utilize, mashallah, tabarakallah, the large quantity of people that are present over here. And so I want to ask every single one of us to participate in a takbir, that comes from the heart and that is meant to truly, listen to me carefully, to truly express our belief 
that Allah is indeed the greatest and Allah is indeed the most powerful and Allah is indeed the most beautiful and Allah is indeed the most merciful and He is more beloved to us and more important to us because when we say Allahu Akbar, what are we saying? We are saying, nothing is more important to me than Allah. When we say Allahu Akbar, we are saying the most beloved and the most precious thing I have is my belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I want every one of us to join together in a takbir that is going to last for generations after us, inshallah ta'ala. We're gonna make the halls of this auditorium reverberate and shake because we're gonna make sure we preserve the takbir for generations to come. You're gonna join me, inshallah? Takbir! That was a three out of 10. We're gonna do this again. Takbir! Five out of ten. We're gonna do one more time and we're gonna literally have the wall shake. Takbir! Allahu Akbar! Zakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.